Radio hacking will be at 11 o'clock, and uh, if you don't realize it's a newbie track, I guess you're a little bit more lost than the rest of us. I was first came out with the Ruby track a couple of years ago, and the idea of the newbie track is um, not to not to insult people, but the talks at uh, DEF CON were getting more abstract and more technical, and it was getting hard to understand one year's track unless you follow the previous year's track. So I established a new track just so for introductions, new ideas, and perhaps things that shouldn't be lined up with uh, the Uber Hacker track, perhaps. So without further ado, we're going to leave you with uh, these two, and hopefully. Um, You'll entertain us. Hello, I'm Pyro. This is Shatter. Hi. Okay, uh, let's start this off completely different than most lectures. I will give you exactly five minutes to ask me any question you want. I will answer completely truthfully about anything you want to know right now without me. Ask. Actually, we're going to make it two minutes. Two minutes, good idea. Two minutes to ask me any question you can think of. Yes, sir. <laughs> English. Yeah, everybody knows everything they want to know about you. They already know it all. That's yeah, interesting. Um, I'm the team leader with Root Cellar. One of the things that my company does is we go in and we check both physical and virtual security on sites. Um, there's not a lot of people anymore that really do a lot of physical testing, which is kind of fun, and you'll see it there. We've got kind of a whole little sneakers video of uh, something we were doing last week. but. Um, we're going to kind of do this a little bit different than usual. If you guys, while we're going through this, if you guys have a question, pop your hand up and wave or stand up or whatever. I think that the quickest and nice, easiest way to do this is if we kind of make this audience interactive versus everybody out there falling back asleep. And uh, come the end, everybody ask for questions and nobody can remember anything. Render, if you want to get that tape going, man. Laser pointer over these tarps.
All right, I've got something that uh, I picked up a couple years back, and I honestly, um, it's typically a little bit more flowery than things that I like, but it's a little question I'd like to ask you guys. Um, I do have to give credit out. This is not mine. This is Red Dragons. It came off IRC, and it, he was handing it out to any of the newbies that were asking questions. I need you guys to answer this for me. Are you a hacker? Take a little quiz today for me today. Yep. <laughs> Tell me if you fit this description. You got your net account several months ago, possibly even years. You've been surfing the net and you laugh at all those media reports of the information superhighway. You have a red box and you don't pay for any phone calls. You have Cracker Jack and you run on every Unix password file you ever come across. Everyone at your school is impressed by your computer knowledge and you are the one that teachers ask for help. Does this sound like you? You are not a hacker. There are thousands of you out there. You buy 2600 and you ask questions. You read Frack and you ask questions. You join Pound Hack and you ask questions. You ask all of these questions and you ask what is wrong with that? After all, to be a hacker is to question things, right? But you do not want knowledge, you want answers. You do not want to learn how things work, you want answers. You do not want to explore. All you want to know is the answers to your damn questions. You are not a hacker. Hacking is not about answers. Hacking is about the tech path that you take to find the answers. If you want help, don't ask for questions. Ask for a pointer to the path that you will need to find out those questions. Find out the answers for those questions yourself. Because it is not the people with the answers that are the hackers. It is the people that are traveling along the path. Red Dragon. I love that. There are so many people nowadays because they sit here and they watch the media coverage that goes on with hacking and they look at their little script kitty buddies that they feel that it's always from point A to point B and then when they hit point B is when they become Uber. And it has nothing to do with that. I want everybody to stand up right now for me. Everybody on their feet. I know this, but get up anyway. Or not, either way. This will keep you from falling asleep. This will keep you from falling asleep. Are you ready? We're going to do a call out here. When I say root, you say seller. When I say seller, you say what? Are ready? Root. Seller. I didn't say that, now did I? Now, I want everybody to sit down. I want you to think about what you just did. Now everybody looks at me with a question face. Why did you stand up when I asked you to? Do I really have any control over your personal lives? Yes. Actually, I don't. I'm not that powerful, only Shatter is. No. The point is, is that everybody is so willing and ready to do things because they think that that's the only way people will be happy or because they don't want to be outside of the norm. It's one of the things that hacking is, it's that you explore the boundaries. And if you can do it legally and you can do it safe, then that's the smartest way you can learn out there. There are a lot of dangers in being the new script kitty on the block. The smartest thing that you can do is if you would like to learn, you need to come to DEF CON or to any of the conventions or to any of the meetings out there or befriend people, but you don't do it by acting like an asshole. You do it by being appropriate and professional and remembering that if you treat people nice, they'll typically treat you nice. Along the same lines of are you a hacker is um, something I've always used to describe when people have asked me that question over the years. And it has been a few, quite a few years I've been doing this. And the first one I usually had to respond with, I said, well, it has to do with the mentality. Hacker is not something that you simply decide one day and go, you know, I'm going to be a hacker. That sounds really cool and I hear about it in the news and, well, I'm going to, you know, get on bug track and learn how to be a hacker because that's what I'm going to do today. So I can read this.org in 20 <laughs> seconds. Yes. The, the only thing, it's a mentality. It's a mindset. It's something you do. You don't need a computer to be a hacker. You don't need um, scripts, you don't need software, you don't need tools. You only need your mind for the most part, and then everything falls after. Um, have you ever torn apart a, a transistor radio? Have you gotten a new piece of equipment, and the first thing that you want to do to it is open up and see how it works, what makes it you know, tick? Um, when you pick up a machine, do you look at the software, or you look and see what kind of RAM it's running? How fast is a RAM? Uh, can you tweak it to go faster? It's these kind of things that make a hacker. How can you take a, uh, uh, what's one, build a, one of the first hacks on the console games was converting a uh, Super Nintendo over to use a VGA adapter. That kind of thing. That's the mindset that I tend to look for when I'm talking with people or working with them and they're asking if they, uh, when they want to be a hacker. And I says, well, you know, have you done these kind of things? And if they say no, I says, well, why are you bothering? Why do you want to do this? 
there's generally there's uh, you know fame, money. Are these the motivators to be a hacker? So um, that was loud. Uh, I've got a statistic down that I was just uh, told the other day, and this obviously isn't from any of the big national sources, but um, I was talking to somebody here at the conference that I have a great deal of respect for, and they said that 90% of the time that you hear about a hacker getting busted, it's one of the script kitties. And you can tell this within the first 30 seconds that you see them in their interview with uh, CNN because they're asking them questions, technical questions, very simple, to what the rest of the world can understand. And whoever's behind the camera sitting there at the interview can't figure out the proper way to answer the question, so they continue to contradict themselves across the board. Um, one of the things that I push with these guys, it's like I grew up in Wyoming. Now that my team is here, Wyoming has no population, to give you an idea how Wyoming is. But one of the things that when I was growing up is I thought I was just the absolute little badass and I had to go out and destroy everything I could possibly get my hands on. And I got this nice little rep and I just thought I was so cool. And then this thing happened one day and I had to grow up. And when I grew up, the problem was is that that rep didn't go away. And I've been working three years, working very, very hard and trying to be very professional to get people to understand that Ruth Seller is what we're trying to do and we're trying to be positive. And uh, I still have people in my own hometown. I just spoke at a Microsoft conference the other day and my throat was slit before I even walked in the doors. They wanted me to come in and do a demonstration. I walked in the doors. They said, you're not allowed to touch our computers. You're not allowed to touch our networks. You're not allowed to touch our phone system. You're not allowed to touch this. You're not allowed to touch that. These are people that I've worked with for years that should be able to trust me, and they would not let me even go in and check my email. So it made it very hard to go speak at a Microsoft conference when I wasn't even allowed to have my own laptop there. Um, another thing that uh, I uh, bring up is that you remain stupid if you use others' codes. Um, it doesn't really make any kind of sense for you to go out and try to be a script kitty. If it's cool that if you're downloading somebody else's codes or using somebody else's exploit, that's a good thing. But you need to study the code and look and see what they did, not just compile it and use it. Compiling is the absolute wrong way. I enforce something very heavily with my guys that's called learning versus compiling. And there's this beautiful thing that they make. It's called a book. You can pick these up at your local library, and they have so much knowledge in them. You can sit down and get something like Pearl in a Nutshell and learn this stuff in days if you really try hard at it. Instead of spending four to five years trying to stumble through somebody else's code, trying to figure out what they're doing and realizing that the final product will just get you, you know, will allow you to take control of the box. By the same token, there's there's another time that there's no sense in rewriting a war dialer. It's been done. There's plenty of them out there. There's no sense in writing a new port scanner. They're, those are out there. So in some sense, there, it's, it is redundant to go out and write the same tool. However, by that same token, you should know how that tool works. Understand when the tool is used and why the tool is used. And this is the problem with a lot of the things right now that you know you can get online you can get on the web you can find the latest exploit you download a patch you hack it or you compile it you run it and you've now owned a system or defaced a website is it hacking no not at all um, does this impress anybody maybe your, your friends or someone who has no knowledge of anything but anybody that has any real talent or works in the industry will not respect it it's not skills and it's not anything to be proud of. Along the same lines with this too is there's a lot of pretense that goes with the script kiddies. They they attempt to go out and impress people talking about skills. You know, well let me see your skills. What skills do you have? You know, they talk about things like they're uh, you're born with these skills. These these are uh, you know it's instinct. I, I have instinctive skills. You have you know Anyone can learn how to use a search engine and find something. This isn't skill. Um, exploiting a system after reading bug track is not skills. Finding the new exploits can take some skill. Other times, it's just pure luck. You stumble across something and you find it, and hey, this is kind of neat. Wow. I remember one um, years back, uh, not too many years, about six years ago, local uh, 
the college had um, internet dial-up access. They had two inbound lines, and those tended to be busy a lot. Well, the, the library system on the same campus also had dial-up access. But we found that it had an automated login script. Well, as it was logging in, we found if you just started hitting a lot of control Gs, suddenly you would get a telnet prompt. And you type, uh, you know, type in your new address, and now you're back at the school system you wanted to be at. So now you've completely bypassed their dial-up pool. That got used for a while, and uh, eventually they found out what we were doing, and then so we would found, we found yet another hole. And all they were doing was simple uh, shell scripts to connect from dial-up into the system. Similar things, too, was we also found that uh, from the same library system, if you telnetted over to the actual public library system, you came in under an anonymous account and it looked like you were root at the system. You didn't have full root access, but you could start sending out email to people. So some of the spoof mails that went out were rather humorous at the time. But again, at the end of it, after we had our fun and played around with it, we did type up a rather long kind of an overall and let the system sysadmins know that, okay, look, here's the problems, here's what we found, and we've gone in and, and listed out the ways they could fix it, and they did take care of it. Uh, a few months later, one of the local script kiddies decided that uh, he had heard that we were going into the public library system, and he decided to come in right behind. And since there was some word of mouth things, he stumbled into it, and we had told them where to lay every trap to find somebody coming in to do this again. Sure enough, um, he was caught, he was arrested, and the press had a field day with it, having fun. And he sat in an interview telling the press how he was really hacking the system to uh, provide the access for his friends to get on the internet. And uh, the key files he was deleting out of the uh, operating system was to make it run better. In the same article, the, um, the admin of the major ISP of the uh, of town, as well as the person who had set up the internet dial-up for the college, they kind of did an alternating paragraph, and every time this guy would list out why he was, you know, taking down the entire library system to make it run better, this guy was saying, well, I don't understand why he's deleting these binaries. You know, these are key components of the kernel to, to run and compile. And in the end, um, you know, the kid still to this day is working at the 76 gas station. That's his job. And he, you know, he got his little 15 minutes of fame, and he got to run around and tell everybody that he was, you know, Mr. Uber Hacker, and that's what he does now. He pumps gas. And meanwhile, everyone else that was around uh, and that had worked on the original system for letting him know what had happened, um, various pro coders, admins, uh, making, you know, the upper six digits and uh, kind of have you know, their own office and they're still to this day hacking on code, working on you know, different tweaks to systems and, and streamlining. And that's part of the difference between scripting, compiling, and learning, and writing. You script, you compile, you're, you know, it's short term, it's instant gratification, and it will not get you anywhere at all. One of the smartest ways to learn things, and this is why uh, DEF CON is such a wonderful thing, is that you have the opportunity to meet some of the absolute best in the world while you're here in Vegas. It's very important that you act professional with these people. If you run up asking for their autograph, they're probably going to look at you quite oddly. You've got to realize most of these people spend a large majority of their time in wire closets and they don't talk to anyone. And then when you come up and you're freaking out and you're trying to make them some big media star icon, these people get very nervous. Um, I wrote down something here that I thought was a pretty good uh, way to describe it for a lot of people that don't, still don't understand, is that I used to box, and I did Golden Glove, and I thought I was just a little, I thought I was the best of the best in my town, because it's, you know, you've always got this nice little pool, and you think you're all big and bad, and I went and I started training with uh, Cesar Hoagland, I'm not sure if you guys know who he is, but he is a professional boxer now, the guy's amazing. And I found out very abruptly and quite painfully that I was nothing. But I trained with him and his brothers for about six and a half months, and I actually got to the point where I could keep up with these guys. And it was amazing that over three years of studying boxing and constantly working and constantly keeping in shape, that I'd only gotten to this one point when I started working with the guys that were so much incredibly better than I was. In a period of six months, I had like 
surpassed anything that I could have possibly wanted to do on my own. While you're here, the smartest thing you can do is come in. If you see somebody that you notice or you recognize a name or their face or whatever, relax. Take a breath, sit down, breathe, and talk to these people. Everyone here at DEF CON is very approachable. Shatter and I, at 3.30 in the morning the other day, we're sitting... Thursday morning. Thursday morning, had a gentleman come in and, uh, you know, we were joking with this guy a little bit, but nothing mean at all. And essentially, by the time things were over, this kitty, who nobody has any idea still who this person is, is essentially chest to chest with Shatter trying to get him to fight. Now, the point is, is one, that's stupid to fight Shatter, because Shatter's a pretty big boy. The other thing that's stupid about it is that <laughs> this guy's not making friends that way. He comes in totally acting like he's some little gangbanger, which doesn't fly at this conference, and uh, ruins any chance that this kid has had of becoming friends with either of us. By the same token, at the same time, at the same time as this is going on, and I'm chit-chatting with him, I'm, I'm chuckling. He's, he's, you know, trying to insult me, making various threats and, and posturing, and going to throw down and kick ass or whatever. And I'm giggling and laughing and inviting him, just get a drink. This is Vegas. We're here to have fun. Let's enjoy. Get a drink. I'll buy you a drink. I don't care. Let's sit down and have fun. I don't even know. He never even introduced himself. First thing out of his mouth was walked up and said, "Yo, y'all hackers." And when we start laughing, it's all, well, you must be sysadmins, because you don't want to give information to nobody. Sysadmins are always assholes. Yeah. And, I mean, this is the way to make friends and influence people. I mean, you guys are, I mean, I'm, we're not kidding. This is not made up. Uh, by the same token, as he walked in and picked me out of the bar to start getting in my face, uh, Pyro was next to me. I had another friend, Pimp Dola, there. Behind him was Fatal, and there's two or three other guys I'm pretty good friends with in the bar at the same time that he's completely circled by. But, you know, he walks right into the middle of this and just starts. I don't know why. I don't know what motivated it. I don't know if I was supposed to be impressed. I wasn't. And now we get to use it as a lecture example. And it's a beautiful one. And you can see that this kid, honestly, was pretty new at things. But it, the thing that was frustrating, you know, the next question that came out of his mouth after, are you a hacker, just before he really starts to throw down is, so you all down with CDC, right? And it's like, yeah, we get along just fine with the guys. Yeah. But, guys. yeah, exactly. Like That's right. <laughs> but, you know, we answer that way. He just, this kid completely goes off. This is not the way. You don't come to con and act like this and expect to learn anything. This kid's already on an ejection list. If anybody sees him, he's automatically ejected because I guess last night he was out in the lobby picking fights with people again. If you're coming to the con, you would like to learn, you can approach anyone. I was walking last night. Goldstein comes walking by and these kids like harass him for about 20 minutes trying to get him to get his autograph. Now, I'm not sure if you know him personally or not. He tends to be a pretty quiet guy and he tends to be pretty laid back. He's one of the nicest guys on earth that you could ever meet. But you don't go up and get in his face and shove a pen up in his nose and say, would you please sign an autograph for me? It's just not the way you do things here at the con. By the same token, there's, there's, there's you know, there's... By just re relaxing and hanging out and being social, you'll meet the darndest people. Um, I'm walking in the back hallway yesterday, and a guy comes up to me and says, excuse me, I have to wear my goon shirt at the time, so that kind of singles me out for people to approach a little more, but nonetheless. And uh, he hands me a card, and I kind of look down, I'm kind of glancing at it, and he says, this gentleman would like to come out and do a question and answer. And he's here right now. And I'm kind of going, oh, okay, I'm going to call the priest. As I'm talking to the priest, I look and I realize that the seal on the card says director of the CIA. And so the guy comes by and chit chat with him and introduce him to the priest. And then they later have the big uh, conference yesterday. And then, you know, he was, though, when I talked, when I first saw him, he was sitting like, I don't know, he could have been like right about here in the middle, sitting in his polo shirt, smiling and, and watching the lecture that's going on. These people are among you. And you can walk up and talk to them. They're there. But walking up and start talking about, yeah, I hack Yahoo, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. First they'll laugh, or, you know, or they'll question you, really, and when did you do this? Well, how did you do it? Well, that is utterly amazing. And, and meanwhile, you're saying you're giving a full confession to something. Okay, let me find the handcuffs. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing. There's a lot of people that once somebody gets spotted as a fed or they think that there's a group of feds there, they instantly, like, blacklist these people. They're here too, and you know what? If they're working for the federal government and this is what they do for a living, they're usually very intelligent people. You should sit down and talk with them. 
Hey, everybody see the gentleman from the Air Force that got busted yesterday? I sat down with him, uh, Clone and I, from Hat Canada. We sat down and discussed and just talked to this guy for probably a good 30, 35 minutes with this guy, and he was great. You know, that's one of the things, like I said, if, if you are here to learn, the greatest thing in the world you can do is go out and grab somebody a drink and sit down and just relax. Um, right now, because of the media coverage that is happening, typically the large majority of the sploits that you're seeing that are going on out there are the web-based people taking down different websites and everything, and it's, you know, that's fine if you've got some message to deliver, but please use spell checker and uh, be use, have the common decency to back somebody's site up if you're going to exploit it. I mean, you should put a little separate directory off to the side and let the sysadmin know that you've done this. Because there's no point. You know how pissed off I get if I've worked on something for 36 hours straight without a shower. I come in the next morning and some 14-year-old's knocked it offline just because he could. It, it gets very, very frustrating. Yeah. This can also lead into another, another one of my major pet peeves that you, if you pin me down and ask me, it, I'll, I'll chew your ear out for several hours. Actually, I don't know. <clears throat> and that's this whole concept of hats. I don't wear a hat. I own I own actually two hats. One of them is for when it's raining and it keeps the water off my head. And the other is my uh, geekculture.com propeller beanie. Because while well, I'm a propeller head, I like geeking out. The media currently loves to put the title of black hat, white hat, gray hat in describing of what a person is doing. Either a person is a, a you know a paladin style white hat hacker who's there only to make everyone's life better in a in a complete utopian society. The other is the evil black hat hackers who are there at you know 3 a.m. and they're raiding your trash and they're tapping your lines and all they want to do is get your credit card number and destroy your life and and, and ruin you. And there are crusaders right now, and I'm sure several of you can name them, who champion for justice and truth against these dreaded black hat hackers. And at any given time that they have a newspaper person in front of them will be glad to uh, make up stories and tell you anything that, do, that you want to hear about just how evil they are and their sex life. <laughs> the whole concept of whether you are doing something wrong, you're doing something right, or it's just pure um, naivete is one, it, it's a mentality. Are you with intent maliciously going out to destroy something? Are you trying to gain access to a system in order to go in and ruin it? And that is what I consider to be the problem, is when you are trying to go and ruin something. Defacing a website is not an example of your skill. With the few exceptions that I've seen done, and they were done well, and to this day people still haven't, not sure how they got in and did it. Um, I like I can I'll cite the New York Times hack. That was a beautiful defacement. It was well done. It was well thought out. No matter how many times they fixed it, it would mysteriously hours later put itself back to the hacked version. And it took them the better part of a week to get all of the little pieces of code and cron jobs and worms and anything else floating around the system out of it. I mean, they completely littered the system with little tiny bits of code. Yet they destroyed nothing. All of the site was fine. It just was a nuisance, and it was very well done. But those, those, are, those are few and far between. Those come around once a while, once a year, once every two years. More often than not, you hear about you know major things like dosing. You know, I I cannot go so I cannot keep saying more, ah, getting tongue tied. I cannot express enough how much dosing is just. It's, it's wrong. It's crass. There's a theoretically no real way to protect against it unless you have bigger bandwidth. That's it. It is the most absolute crass attack possible. It, it's as bad as somebody um, decides to, um, you know, you say something and they blow you off and you pull out a gun and blow their brains out against a wall. It's about that drastic of an attack. It does not only are you hurting, you're aiming at the, your initial target, but every system along that line, and if you do a trace route, you can see how many of them you are hurting. You, every one of those is taken offline and destroyed. I've seen DOS attacks that have lasted days that have brought down major chunks of the system. Um, 
case in point, uh, it was I think earlier this year or last fall, uh, our friend J-Dog up in uh, Seattle, he, uh, some IRC kitties got annoyed at and decided to start um, start flooding his, uh, what was he on? I think it was on DSL at the time. And they not only took him out, they took out um, the ISP, and they took out a good chunk of, of major networks throughout all of Seattle. And it was taken down for a good 18 hours, simply because of who he was dating. Nothing else. He had done nothing to anyone. It was just IRC talk. And these guys retaliated because they're going to show him. There was in the lobby last night was based off of an argument that had occurred on IRC. I have some major news for people. IRC is fake. It's not real life. You don't have to come to the con looking to pick a fight with somebody because you argued with them on IRC. Typically, 90% of us that are on IRC <coughs> are there to have fun. And that's how we do it, is by getting under people's skin. But you're not supposed to come to the con and threaten people and get in this massive fight with them. Actually, give me an example about kicking in somebody's door. Oh, yeah, me and that one. Um, okay, changing gears again. This a little bit. Some other thing goes in with the defacements. Um, I was thinking about it one day because I kind of consider the philosophy of, of the whole aspect. I mean, everyone talks about the technical skill. I, a lot of times, think about the philosophy of what we're doing, the, the humanity issues and repercussions. A lot of the defacements I've seen, I'll check them out on attrition and see what, you know, what's been happening lately. And I'll see a string of them all from the same group. You'll see like 14 defacements that day. And all they really did was they found an exploit and they systematically went down a string of websites and were probing the system to see if it was open to that attack. If it was, they went in, the script automatically uploaded their version of the page and moved on to the next one. They weren't even at a keyboard. They didn't need to be. They can just let this, this thing run at night and it will go through and deface for them and they can you know, claim they have skill with this. And they're hitting these websites that are these little tiny mom and pop domains that could just be some guy's personal website. Um, it could even be something as, as horribly insecure as a uh, Windows 98 uh, web server. This isn't a. This is not a hard system to take down. I. You can. I mean, a shares attack will take it out in 15 seconds. But, you know, how easy it is it to walk up to a five-year-old and punch him in the nose? I mean, this is not anything difficult. And I kind of attribute it because they, the, the explanation that they give every single time is their justification for the attack and defacement was they should have had better security. And we're just trying to help them out by taking down their site. Yeah, we're going to teach them a lesson and, and show them that they need better security by wiping them out. Because I'm here to teach them because I've got skills. I, I've heard this, this is quoted. I'm not, you know, I've heard it too many times. And it, the, the example of this, of, of someone needing better security is, is if I'm walking down the street and I see your house, and I walk up and I put my foot through the door, and I now take the VCR, I'll haul the TV, I'll search for some cash, take some valuables, and I leave a note saying, you should have had better security. You should have had an alarm system on your house. You should have had a full steel door with a metal frame with two inch, uh, you know, one way bolts on it, as well as a full video surveillance system, um, how about uh, we could mine, we could put landmines in the front yard, barbed wire around the house, and have running dogs and electrify everything? Is that enough security to protect your house from me putting my foot through the door? And by that same token, why should you have to put up that kind of security to protect you from me? It's it's not right. So that's that's one of the reasons these defacements really just annoy me, and they, they just get me angry because they're they're crass. They're not. It's not like you attacked a you know a high level firewall, bypassed it, and and gained root access on um, on I don't know, eBay, say that that you've now owned the entire eBay cluster. It's nothing like that. You're going in and attacking a very small single system that's either based out of a home or a co-location situation. More likely, so it could be probably a home-based DSL or, or, or partial T1 or something. These aren't hard to do. And just because it's easy to do is by no means grounds that you should do it. So, um, The next one I have up there is uh, developing a rep, and it's kind of, it's, 
a little bit different. I didn't really want it to come across that way, but I didn't know another way to phrase it. Anonymity is a great thing. If that's what you're going for, that is perfect. But if you're trying to be a security professional, you need to develop yourself a very well-known, positive reputation. The only way you're going to do that. Um, that's one of the reasons I asked that question at the beginning. I asked you, he said, you know, I'll give you a few minutes. Ask me any question you want about me, and I'll answer them. And at that time, I would have. I won't now. I will not tell you some of the things I have done. That was the time to ask it. But I have been doing this since, uh, I think I got started um, actually doing uh, freak. I was originally doing freaking back in 82, 83, sometime around that. And I didn't even have a computer at the time. And, you know, I discovered the, the uh, really neat way to make a lot of free long distance telephone calls, and it was fun. But by that same token, I have not gone around bragged about it. I haven't written uh, all forms of text files and such and, and tried to gain as much notoriety as I can because of it. It's something I did. It's something I was doing. And for many years, I wasn't even aware that anyone else was doing it. I thought maybe I'd stumble on something really kind of neat and cool and I'm keeping it to myself. Or once in a while, you know, punching a code for a friend. And they're like, well, how'd you do that? I'm like, I just know. But the, the norm lately of the last few years has been to do something and then talk about it, you know. Hit IRC and brag. And, and brag to everyone and anyone that will listen about what you've done. Especially because, the federal agents, it seems like. Yeah, because you want fame, because you want reputation. And, you know, that's kind of along the lines of where we're going with this, this aspect. The point is, is that whether or not you are going to be black hat or white hat, you should always try for a positive reputation. If you're going around telling people how badass you are because you think you can, you know, root this dot org in 20 seconds, 20 which seconds was, was what our little bud that tried to get in a fight with Shatter was telling us the other day. Um, the point is, is that nobody's going to be taking you seriously. If you're at a client's that you're checking security for, and you're talking to one of your buddies that just happens to work there and you're telling them all about this box that you were nailing down last night. It's not going to make the, you know, your client feel very secure about having, their, having you on their site. They're trusting you with their network. Always try to shoot for the, for the positive image. And it's very important to DEF CON to do this. You will have cameras in your face everywhere. No matter what you were doing at DEF CON, there's probably a news crew around somewhere because DEF CON has become increasingly popular with the public. Very, very important thing is to present DEF CON professionally. It doesn't matter who you are, what part of the world you're from, what your style is, what crew you're from, whether or not you're black or white hat, but present yourself professionally because you are going to represent every single one of us. And there are a lot of people that are going to be extremely pissed off if you go up there and try to act like some little badass and they can't answer a question if it's asked. Um, I've, we're going to really start moving here because we've got a lot of people flooding in. I think we're running short on time, but we're getting low. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I got on how to learn, there's an old standard trick. There's this great collection of books called the Rainbow Books, and granted, a large majority of the information out there is uh, really behind on time. But at least look these over so you understand what people are talking about when they're using different terminologies. Another one along the same lines of, of doing your research is there, there's, there's kind of the old, uh, some of the old phrases like, you know, those, those who, who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Well, that's the same in computers. I've, I've seen over my years of doing things that I've seen cycles come and I've seen some real, I mean, I mentioned the control G hitting it a bunch of times at the, uh, at the system to gain a, a telnet prompt. We used to do the same thing on the BBSs. You could, you could fire a bunch of control characters at a system and suddenly you, you crash the BBS software and you're sitting at, at a prompt on the guy. The, these old, some of these, these old, really stupid things will sometimes work again. And you can, you can learn a lot by sometimes looking at the way things used to work and try to take that old, simple approach like the old black box. That was simply nothing more than a resistor. That same aspect can be used again, possibly in a different angle, but be used again to apply to more modern technology. The more complicated the machine, the more likely there, there are things to break on it. And sometimes a stupid little thing that no one would ever think to try may do it. Um, 
Join the list servers, bug track, MT security, InfoSec, uh, any of these, these are great to be on. And granted, you'll probably receive about a thousand pieces of email a day. The point is, if you flip through and just look at the subject line, it's a great way to learn because it keeps you pretty close to the cutting edge. Um, and come to cons, talk to different people like this. Uh, next question, next section we got up there is hacking without going to jail. Um, there's a lot of people that seem to think that the only way they're going to learn how to hack and learn computer security is if they go out there and try to do it where they're working or to one of their enemies or whatever. Go to your local libraries, go to your local schools. Typically they have old 486 machines sitting in a closet. They, they would just love to pay somebody to get out of their way. Bring it home, throw a network card in there, install whatever OS you're trying to uh, learn, and go to town. If it's in your house, it's on your lines, on your time, it's 110% legal. You can do anything you want to it without having to worry about hurting somebody else or without having to worry about going to jail. Um, no, let's keep on going. Okay, I think what else we had? There's, there's Take Facebook advantage of uh, freeware and open source. Everybody's handed out at the conference. I mean, they're passing it out left and right, and it's a great way to learn. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to wrap it up because we got the next crew coming in. Yeah. So. Well, thank you, guys.